guys um this is a weird little video i look like an absolute wreck because i just woke up i haven't got any makeup on i'm in my pajamas <laughs> I needed to film this video because I'm going to Italy tonight and then I'm going traveling so I'm not gonna have any time to do it anytime soon as you guys will all know mostly the Kirsch trial came out last night I was at the midnight release party in London and I did a vlog of that which is already uploaded so that's just below this and I thought I would quickly do an, a sort of analysis video of Kirsch child I did film one as soon as I'd seen the Kirsch child play because, because I wanted to um, be able to discuss the plot points with you guys um, and also discuss the parts that maybe didn't make it into the script so the magic parts and sort of the theatrical side of it which is what I'm going to try to do very very briefly I've only read the first part of the book but I've got all my notes from when I saw it so I'm going to try and briefly just whiz through the story and point out the main parts if you don't already know the story you might find yourself a bit lost but I will be referring to this but I'm mostly just going to be discussing parts of it that aren't necessarily um, prevailing in the book particularly well. Firstly I'd like to point out I'm actually really happy that a lot of the humour I think is coming through especially from Scorpius. I don't know whether I'm getting the humour through because I'm when I'm reading this script I'm picturing exactly how the actors said it and the sort of the comedic way they would say things and the timing so I don't know if that would come through um, for someone reading it that hadn't seen the play. First I'd like to start out by saying about how the initial opening scene is done just because in the book we get nothing from it really about how it opens the it says that they're on stage and that there's this um lots of suitcases and everything because obviously at that platform nine three quarters but generally there isn't any sort of description as to how that's set out the way there are a lot of interludes between scenes which are sort of like dance numbers but not really dance numbers where they're set to music and they move around with cloaks and stuff this opening scene features a lot of magic there's a hat suspended in the middle of the stage which we find out is actually the sorting hat but it actually looks like a cowboy hat and um that is sort of the focal point of this opening sort of number where they're all moving around suitcases and everything there's a cool moment where all of the like the potters and the weasleys they walk forward the kids and they turn around on the spot and suddenly they're in hogwarts robes like it's the weirdest thing ever and that stood out to me as one of the most magic moments which i've written in my notes i've just put magic in big capital letters my notes make no sense from when i went to see it the music is excellent and the choreography is also really good and then from then on the whole in the in the script it sort of transitions quite fast between the years and i think i don't know whether people would find that confusing if you haven't seen the play but it it's like done really well where it's sort of a big transition it just skims through the first four years of hogwarts just going back to platform nine three quarters again and again um and you just see the deterioration of um albus's relationship with harry which i think is very important we see the sort of blossoming friendship between um scorpius and albus especially since albus is sorted into slytherin um when we first hear the rumors about sort of the potential of Scorpius being Voldemort's son and all of that crazy stuff. Scorpius and Rose are ship it straight from the start, even though Rose hates him. It's pretty it's pretty cute. And then we start to see the first sort of signs of the trouble in the wisdom world. Um something there are a couple of really cool moments that I just want to point out from this first act of the part one. Um when Harry and Hermione are in bed and Harry has the bad dream about um being back with the Dursleys and when Hagrid came to see him for the first time, if you've read the book you know which part I'm talking about he has that first bad dream and Hagrid is stood over the bed and he sort of shakes a blanket out and suddenly Ginny and Harry appear under the blanket no idea how they did it like I was sat like at a position where I could probably see like most of the magic like how it was done but I couldn't see anything like it was completely mind-blowing there was a really cool choreographed scene whereby um all the students were doing magic and there were they were like firing spells and stuff but it was all set to music which I just wanted to point out because that was really cool I can't remember as precisely where that came in this because they don't sort of mention these choreograph scenes in the script but like I can understand because you don't really get the point um, of them through here. And then every time they go into the Ministry of Magic they have a telephone box and it says in the book they dial the number and they go into the Ministry of Magic but in the play they literally get their cloaks with them in it like sort of fold into the into the magic box like the magic box the the ple the um telephone box I don't really know how to describe it without it sounding really lame and weird but like it's the coolest it was one of the coolest pieces of magic i've ever seen like they literally just disappear into it like i've no idea how it's like impossible um the tricks were just sort of mind-blowing anyway 
Another thing I wanted to point out that was really weird because it's not made a big deal of in the script particularly like it's it comes out of nowhere and it was very shocking to me when I was watching the play this whole thing with the trolley lady the trolley lady is, um, is at the top of the Hogwarts Express as Scorpius and Albus try to escape and she grows these weird it literally says in the book I want to find the part so I can actually um be like say what it says but she literally says uh, she's picking up punk pumpkin pasties she throws it like a grenade it explodes i mean this is just weird in itself the trolley lady's just going very strange and then it says here the trolley lady's witch hands transfigure into very sharp spikes right that does not do it justice at all it's the weirdest thing she stood there this crazy trolley lady who has been such an ins insignificant part of any of the books of any of the stories and the films she's just one of those characters that's always just there so this was so random this felt like i was watching some weird fan fiction but i, I loved it it was great she started growing these weird it was like claws out of her hands she just stood there and they didn't even serve a particular purpose because she didn't try to stop them getting off the train she was like oh no one's ever escaped my train before and then they just jumped off and she just stood there with these weird claw hands so it was very very strange but i've literally wrote in my diary in my um, notes in capital letters trolley lady equals edward scissor hands because i was just freaking out i had no idea what was going on there <laughs> when they um transform into with the polyjuice potion this was one of my favorite scenes in the entire thing and i think the humor did partly come across in the book but just nowhere near what it was like because i was in hysterics it was so funny when they transfigured in sort of polyjuice potion wise the their transition the way it was done on stage was incredible to watch as well because they did it so like they would sort of emerge from their cloak and then they would the other like the actors playing harry um playing albus and scorpius and delphi just disappeared and it was, it was really weird and cool the humor of, of albus playing ron and then like repeatedly like kissing hermione and all of this stuff and the way he would say like darling and everything it was so so funny just the hot that whole scene was probably one of the funniest parts of the whole play for me and the play was pretty damn funny in most in a lot of places that whole scene was done excellently the acting was flawless and i think that really made that scene because um polyjuice scenes i think are really tricky anyway but it really sort of made it. Again, I've written here there are like sort of moving staircase scenes, and there is a moving staircase scene that's described in here, but it's later on where um, Scorpius and Albus are like not allowed to be friends at that time, and there's it, the staircase scene is described quite nicely, to be fair, in the script, but um, there were a lot of staircase scenes where they, they were sort of transitional scenes where they sort of moved around to music as well, um, which was really, really cool. I've written something here that I just can't even decipher. Hellarinus. Oh, hilarious. I've written here, some crazy fucking fan fiction. That's what I've written. Okay, so now moving on to sort of like act two, it's just plot twist after plot twist. Like, it's all just crazy. Like, so when there's, I'm not gonna go into loads of detail with the story because I just don't have the time in this, um, but everything gets sort of twisted because they go back in time to try and save Cedric Diggory with the time turner they found, and it's all just sort of crazy. Um, and at first when the time turner sort of storyline came into this i was like this is opening up a giant load of plot holes but to be honest it didn't really like everything fit really nicely with sort of the rest of the books and everything sort of worked in canon nicely that wasn't too bad this i'm gonna sort of try and skim through this as much as possible but in the second act we have moni myrtle and her the scene with moni myrtle in it was so funny and this is one where i don't think the humor came across at all really in the script just because that scene was all down to the acting of Moaning Myrtle because the actress that did it was incredible and there were a lot of like sort of innuendos that you miss in the script because they're really hard to sort of work out where the jokes are supposed to be but it's the inflections on the words that make it important. After they um, sort of go back in time then basically after all, all of this crazy stuff's happening and um, there is a moment that I think is important to note which is when um, Albus and Scorpius, they haven't been allowed to be friends and then they're trying to be friends again and he's like, um, friends and then Scorpius is like, always and everyone in the audience went, oh, because it was like, this, like, always is such like a prominent word in the Harry Potter series so everyone in the audience was like, gasped and was like, oh, my heart so that was really cool actually, I, I enjoyed that moment and then the end of Act 2 is, for the first part is just so confusing because it's just like, Voldemort Day in, it's important to note in in Cursed Child they refer to Voldemort as Voldemort. They pronounce it without the T, which is a, a, how Joe intended it to be read initially because the T was silent. But I actually really enjoyed that. I thought that was a good. Um, I think that was a good addition to the sort of play. While so this is between um, part one and part two. I just wanted to talk quickly about aesthetics because the aesthetics of the play um, were so it's hard to explain, but 
the you can see I'm wearing this new style of um, badge and they have a new redesign for all of the Hogwarts uniform and the badges. I really like this new style for a couple of reasons. With the Harry Potter films especially, they have a timeless quality to them in that you can't really put a date on them because all of the clothes and everything, they could really be from any sort of fairly modern point in, in our sort of world, but they, they are quite hard to put a date on. And they've done that perfectly with Cursed Child aesthetic, but they've also modernised it. So in a way that our world modernises and our things progress, you can see the progression of the wizarding world and how time just makes things change anyway but it also still remains timeless if that makes sense i'm not explaining this particularly well but it was done incredibly i think um i think it was the perfect way for them to modernize it so i just want to talk about that in between the gap of the part one and part two part two starts with because at the end of part one they have dementors come on which is like a really intense scene because the dementors um, it's like terrifying it's, and it's really weird but they have these big um, Dolores Umbridge shows up declares it Voldemort day um, well she said tells Scorpius it's Voldemort day um, we find out Harry Potter's dead and all because they messed with time and these big um, these new I don't know if you if you watch my Cursed Child Hall video you see I had a badge that had this new sort of serpent design on it and that's like Voldemort's new symbol which again is modernised and I, I really love it um, and that's all there so when we start with um, Cursed Child part 2 um, there's this intro sequence where all the Death Eaters are coming on and they're doing these cool things with their capes to music, which I thought was stunning. Good that I've put here, good staircase action. Um, so Delphi, who I haven't really talked about at all, she is supposedly Amos Diggory's um, niece, but it turns out that's not entirely the case. So I'm just going to cut to the chase here. She's sort of been tricking Albus and Scorpius this whole time. Turns out she's Voldemort's daughter with Bellatrix Lestrange. She found out from Rodolphus, um, who is Bellatrix Lestrange's husband, Bit awkward and um, there was this really cool moment which I haven't got to this part in the book yet so I don't know how it's described but um, they the whole theatre they've basically um, Ron and Hermione Hermione's Minister for Magic but like not in this setting because it's all really weird and twisted but then it is because they go back in time and fix things it's a very confusing storyline you do have to sort of keep on your toes because it does get a bit confusing um, but basically they go to her room where she's staying because they're trying to work out who the hell she is because it turns out she's not Amos Diggory's niece because he didn't have any brothers or sisters so it's impossible and they turn and the whole thing goes into UV lights and the whole theatre is covered in runes like above your head the seats everything is covered in it um and it's like the impact is just amazing and they have and it's written like Voldemort's daughter and stuff it's all like plans that Delphi's done um, and she's basically wanting to go and like be like her father or like avenge her father or get to know him in some weird way so she wants to go back in time and basically save him um there have been some nice scenes which i thought i'd mention quickly um between dumbledore and harry as well which i thought were quite important to note which um i'll probably regret when i make this video not going into them in more detail um just because there were some really nice um quotes actually that i haven't been able to go through and find yet but I'll probably make a more in-depth video um, doing proper analysis of the story um, and the actual writing uh, and later date, but this is just a brief, oh my god, it's out overview. Um, anyway, so there are a lot, basically, um, another cool thing, um, I don't know how they describe it as touching wrists in here, but in the alternate universe where Voldemort has won and it's Voldemort day, they have this thing where they go for Voldemort for Valor and they, they touch their wrists like this and I don't, I didn't. I wanted to show you guys how they do it because it, I don't think it was described particularly well. Like, th they say Dolores Umbridge touched her heart and then she touched her wrists, but like people might think that's just like that. But they literally just go for Voldemort for Valor, and it's really cool. Like, it looked really, really cool on stage. Um, so that was that was pretty cool. I've put a De Delphi major shithead, so that's nice. When they find out that when the alternate universe, um, when they're trying to fix things before stuff gets fixed. Um, they find out that uh, Cedric Diggory killed the devil because Cedric, Cedric ends up living and he turns into a Death Eater, and which that's basically why Voldemort wins and Harry dies because Neville could never kill N Nagini and Cedric killed Neville. And the whole, when they said that Cedric killed Neville, the whole theatre just gasped and was like, oh my god. It was just so weird, like everyone was talking, it was just so funny. Everything sort of starts to get resolved. There's um, some really sweet moments between like Albus and um, his dad, but basically um, Albus and Scorpius end up stuck um, on the night of Harry's parents' death um, in the past. And they managed to send a message to Harry using a love, juice, a love potion bottle and 
this old blanket of Harry's. It's a hard thing to explain if you've read it or seen it, you'll know what I'm talking about. They base and then Ron, Hermione and Ginny and Harry come and they all have a plan to try and capture Delphi um, because Delphi's taken them to that night because she wants to, they think she wants to like save Voldemort but instead of him like losing his power when he tries to kill Harry, something like that. And anyway, um, they all sort of manage to fix things but there's a this really sort of dramatic scene where they're all stood there and they've caught Delphi and Harry, Ron, Hermione, Ginny and his kids um, they're all standing and they watch Harry's parents die and everyone in the audience was just sort of breaking down because it was like it was really loud like the um, the way they did it and like they're all clutching each other like crying and you can hear like Lily and James and like talking before they die and it was really um, it was really emotional to watch like everyone was just sobbing because it was so so powerful like just the way it was set out I don't really know how they've done it in the book because like I say I've only got about halfway through because I was so exhausted when I got back last night but um it was just really powerful and then they all go home and <coughs> the sort of relationship between Albus and um his and Harry is sort of attempted to be fixed and stuff but yeah the point is it all ends good which was important because I was getting very distressed um, when I went to watch it that everything was just going to be completely messed up. I, before I went, I didn't see any spoilers before I went to see it, so everything to me was a big shock. Um, like, I just, just couldn't process it, it was just plot twist after plot twist. I saw some people that haven't seen it that have just read it, just read it, just read spoilers, complaining about the storyline. I'm really hoping that if you haven't seen the play, the story comes off as well in this book, because I still can't even really judge how well it's coming off because I've seen the play. Um, in my head I'm still picturing how it's set out, how they're saying it, so I find it really hard to give sort of a impartial view to it, but I'm, I'm hoping that the humour and everything else comes out because it would be a shame if it didn't. Although Jo said on the red carpet yesterday she was like I want everyone to be able to see this play, so I'm really hoping that maybe give it a year or so they'll do like a proper recording of it, I would, I would like that. Um, I think they have plans to take it on tour. I can't imagine they, why they wouldn't. I personally am a big fan of this story. I think it was the best thing they could have done as like a sequel in a way because I think if they tried to mess with anything else it would have been difficult. I was a bit concerned before I saw it just because I didn't want anything to sort of ruin what we already had. But I think the way they did this, the, I think the fact that the story is so crazy and, and I don't think any of us could have predicted it, um, I think that makes it better because it sort of just adds something completely new to it. I like how we've got loads of new information that's canon. There's this really funny scene at the end where um, Harry and Albus are talking and Albus, I don't, again, I'm not sure if the humour really will come out here in the, in the book, but um, the, Harry's like, oh no, I'm scared of loads of things because Albus is like, oh, you're not scared of anything, famous Harry Potter, exactly, etc, etc. Et and um, Harry's like, oh, actually, I'm quite scared of pigeons. So now it's canon that Harry Potter's scared of pigeons. And um, and Albus was like, and Dumbledore said to Albus, oh, you know, look, you're going to turn into a great wizard. And Albus is like, oh, I'm not planning on being a, a great wizard. And he's like, well, what are you doing? And Albus is like, I'm going into pigeon racing. I'm very excited about it. And like, it was just the funniest thing. Everyone just cracked up because it was just so, it's very Albus. And yeah, Gorpius Malfoy has quickly become probably my favourite character in the entire Harry Potter series ever. Um, I know everyone's going to start loving him now. And so for a little, so between me seeing the play and this coming out, I was, I've had like, my secret I was just like I'll just enjoy having a new favorite character before he becomes everyone's favorite character again um but he is just like the perfect image of Scorpius because he's he's like the complete opposite of like Draco like I have I I I don't have like a bad view of Draco either because I think he's a complex character but um Scorpius is just so kind and funny and a massive geek he's very Hermione-esque but like more hilarious so he's a great character and I really hope that he comes across well in the book because he was at like outshone, like everyone was completely amazing but he did sort of shine as being like the probably one of the most iconic characters and the acting from Anthony Boyle was like helped that obviously because he'd played it amazingly. I think that's pretty much everything I have to say, I'll remember stuff um, afterwards that I forgot to put in. Oh yeah, <laughs> just the audience's reaction when um, they're at the Triwizard Tournament and they, they're like a Victor Crazy Crumb and Cedric a Delicious Diggory because me and Becca just turned to each other and was like, what are we watching? We were like, why are they doing this? It was just so funny because it's just the most random thing. This whole thing feels like some crazy fan fiction, especially the trolley lady part. I will never be over it. I, would, I don't think I'll ever get over it. 
um, the whole thing does feel like a crazy fan fiction, but like I think that's what makes it so great. Um, so I really hope you guys enjoyed the story as much as I did, and this video probably didn't make a lot of sense if you haven't already a read the storylines online somewhere or read the book or seen the play. Um, so I'm hoping it made some sort of sense, but I just wanted to put my input in um, and talk about that. I'm hoping this won't be too long. I did make a video. Uh, as soon as I went and saw the play, but it was like 40 minutes and I only got through part one So I was like, okay, I can't post that so I deleted it and started again um, with this But yes, um, I'm hopeful that it all comes across well because I just thought it was great And I can't wait to go through the book and analyze some more get some actual details and quotes And then I'll make a more in-depth video at a later date also just wanted to quickly say um, to anyone who came spoke to me yesterday at the um, release party thank you that was really nice um i got to see so many people and i had an amazing time at the release party like it was honestly one of the best nights of my life um so if you want to go see what i did and what they had there um I, my vlog isn't as good as i really wanted it to be but i was just having such a good time i didn't have time to really sort of like film everything and, and take photographs but i managed to get some stuff so um we'll see how that goes but yes um i hope you enjoyed this and if you have any questions about Cursed Child, the play, um, and you want to ask questions about um, certain scenes and how they were set, I remember pretty much everything. Um, like, as I'm reading it, more stuff even comes back to me now. So um, if you do want more information, feel free to just drop me a DM on Instagram. I'm going away to Italy, like I said, like early hours of tonight, tomorrow morning. Um, and then pretty much as soon as I get back, I've got a few days where I'm in Northampton, then I'm going travelling and then I go to university. So it's all going to be crazy from here on out, but um, I'm going to try and keep posting um, as frequently as I can. Have fun reading the rest of this crazy book.